Okay, active learning. This should be a goal for all of our classrooms. Now, why do I say that? Let's think about this quotation that I've seen in numerous sources. Now, if all we are after is this type of transfer of information, it can be done a lot more effectively than lecture. Just hand the, the notes to the students. But if we want more from learning than that, then we have to think of effective ways to do it. So given that, what should our focus be? Is it presenting content or student mastery and retention of content? Or another way to look at it is, we want the students to comprehend the content that we present. Now, I realize that I've set up to some degree a false dichotomy between presenting content and mastering content. I know that students can't master something that hasn't been presented to them. And I also know that none of you are content with just spouting off a lot of stuff and not caring if students understand any of it. But what I fear is, all too often, the result of what we do in the classroom tends more toward emphasizing presentation instead of mastery. We need to remember that learning is not a spectator sport. Students don't learn much, and I'm quoting here from an article I'll cite, it, I'll cite at the end, students don't learn much just by sitting in class listening to teachers, memorizing prepackaged assignments, and spitting out answers. They must talk about what they're learning, write about it, relate it to their experience, apply it to their daily lives. They must make what they learn part of themselves. You see, I want to clarify something. I'm not just saying that kids need to be busy. There are plenty of ways to keep them busy which don't lead to real learning. After all, we all know the word busy work. And I'm not just looking for classes where all the students are on task, where they're not distracted doing other things. Students can be focused on the lesson and still not really learning. Instead, we want to see classes where students are active in doing things. This may mean they're up out of their seats working on projects. It might mean they're actively involved in instruction in some other way, but the focus is on student action and work. But what makes this different from just busy work is that the students also need to be thinking about what they're doing. In busy work, students can do something like copy a spelling list ten times without ever thinking about those words. They can put their mind on autopilot, just copy the words over and over while their mind is a million miles away. Or they can endless, mindlessly copy teacher notes from a PowerPoint without having any idea what those notes mean or how to apply the teaching. Instead, we want our students to give serious thought to understanding what they're doing. Why is this happening when we do this experiment? How does this point in the lecture relate to what I read last night? Why is this word spelled that way? You see, real learning doesn't take place just because something goes into a student's working memory where he uses it to copy notes or spelling words. Nor does it take place in short-term memory where he puts facts to remember for the test next period or cramming. Real learning happens when a student is using information in short-term memory to make connections and to apply what's in his long-term memory, things he already knows. When those neural pathways are developed, the student truly learns the material. Our goal as teachers needs to be finding ways to push students into consciously thinking in this way about what we teach, active engagement with the content. Now, there are many ways to do this. You have project-based learning, you have discovery learning. There's a lot of things that can be done in this way. But here's the thing, though. We're still going to have lectures, including other forms of direct instruction, where basically the teacher is communicating information to the students. We're not going to have a complete discovery-based learning model. So how can we deliver lectures in a way that keeps students actively engaged? We can call this 
the interactive lecture. Let's see some differences between a traditional lecture and an interactive lecture. In a traditional lecture, the teacher talks and the students listen with few interruptions. In the interactive lecture, the teacher talks with regular pauses for student and structured activities. In a traditional lecture, we generally notice students starting to lose focus after about 10 or 15 minutes. In the interactive lecture, when student interest begins to wane, there's a planned activity to maintain interest. How does the teacher ask questions? In the traditional lecture, most questions are rhetorical. The teacher answers his own questions. And when he does want students to answer, it's usually done by students raising their hands and the teacher calling on one of them. In the interactive lecture, the teacher expects his students to answer the questions and he might do it in a way that he uses a student response system like clickers, poll everywhere, Socrative, personal whiteboards. We'll talk about this a little bit later. The idea is the teacher asks questions to get all the students actively involved in answering questions. In our traditional lecture, the students listen quietly and individually take notes. Student to student talk is discouraged. But in the interactive lecture, student-to-student -student talk is encouraged and students regularly work in pairs or in groups. In a traditional lecture, very little attempt is made to systematically check for student comprehension and few opportunities are provided during the lecture for correction of misunderstanding. In the interactive lecture, comprehension is regularly and systematically assessed and students have regular opportunities to get misunderstandings corrected. So, let's look at some ways to make a lecture into an interactive lecture. Now, here is what I'm not talking about. Giving out students, giving out handouts to the students of notes with blanks for them to fill in while you're lecturing, usually while you're using a PowerPoint that has the blanks filled in. Now, I know why you do it. You can be sure that the students have the right answers. You can avoid students wondering what the main points of the lecture are. And it gives them something to use to prepare for the test. After all, all they have to do then is memorize these notes. But what's the problem here? Well, students don't have to really think at all beyond just having part of their mind following along as you talk. So if they happen to hear the words on the page and then they know Okay, I need to listen up and figure out what goes in the blank. And then you also have students looking on each other's papers. Wait, wait, wait. What was in that blank? What did he say? Did you get that word? How do you spell it? Or you have a student who misses class, and all he needs to do is just get a copy of a friend's notes to fill in the blanks. He doesn't even have to think about what the words mean because he's just saying, okay, the first blank, here's the word. Second blank, here's the word. And he's not even thinking at all. But this gets back to our opening slide. Lecture then becomes just transferring your notes to the student notes without information passing through either of your minds. If all you want is for them to have the right specific words in their notes, just give them the completed notes and save them the trouble of having to listen to the lecture. Just give them the notes. But if you want them to think about the content, which we should all want, this is not the way to do it. So if we're not going to do this, how do we get students to take notes and think about the content? One easy way to do this is called the pause procedure. Every eight to ten minutes, pause your lecture and give the students a couple of minutes to write down notes. Research tells us that our brains can only handle about ten minutes of new information through lecture before the brain needs to process that information. Pausing for a minute or two gives the students' minds time to do that. So you might encourage them to turn to someone else to rework or fill out their notes. You're not giving them fill in the blanks, it's just blank notes. Or you might use this Cornell system that's illustrated here. They divide their paper into three sections. On the right, in the larger section, 
they're taking traditional notes. Here's just basically writing down notes about what you're saying. And they might do this though, they might complete this, fill this out during the pause that you give them. In the left column, they add things like questions they have about the notes, or study questions, or applications, or other things that aren't literally in the lecture. Then, when they have that couple of minute pause every 10 minutes, at the bottom of the page, they note the key points to the lecture. What's the main idea of these notes? What is the teacher after? And then these notes will help the students review when it comes time to study for a test. So pause every eight to 10 minutes, let the students fill in their notes, give them a minute to process, let them even turn to one another and say, wait, I missed this point. What did he say? And go on. Okay, another thing you can do is the think, pair, share method. Uh, again, every 10 minutes or so. Just stop lecturing and ask a question about what you just said. It could be as simple as, what were the two main points to remember about triangles? Or something like, now think to yourself, how do you think this doctrine of total depravity relates to the idea that unbelievers often do good things? So ask a question, give the students about 30 seconds to think of an answer. Then say, now, I want you to turn to one person near you, and both of you share your answer with each other, and help each other out if you need to. So, you give them about a minute just to talk briefly with one another, then say, okay, now, what were the two main points again? Johnny and Billy. You look and you call on one pair of students that were talking together, Johnny and Billy. What were the two main points? Then you just move on with your lecture. Again, what's happening is you're giving the students time to mentally process the lecture content. You can also use student response systems. The idea here is that you want to check frequently during the lecture to see if the students are understanding you, rather than waiting till the very end of the lesson and saying, anyone have any questions? Or it's better than just hoping that the students will interrupt you if they have a question. They won't. Instead, you want to force them to let you know whether they understand or not. And you want to check all student understanding, not just the one or two you might ask a question. When you ask a question to a specific student, you don't know if the other students understand or not. So there's several ways to do this. Some of these are illustrated here. Students might have personal marker boards, and so you ask a question, they write a quick answer and hold up their boards. You can look around quickly and see who gets it and who doesn't. You could use yes-no signs, you could use multiple choice cards like down there at the bottom where you get everybody's got cards that have A, B, C, or D. And you ask a question, you give them four choices and they hold up the answer. You also have technological things. There are student response systems like clickers, like you see over there. But with our BYOD program, it's easier to use something like Socrative or Poll Anywhere to get some quick feedback. Whatever you use, the idea is you want to know throughout your lecture whether the students are understanding it or not, and you want to know whether they all are. In this way, you can tell, okay, most of the students are missing this. Let me explain that point one more time. If you wait till the next day, they've forgotten it, you've forgotten it, and you need to go on. So if you can do this throughout the lecture, that helps. Finally, you can use short in-class writing assignments. Every 10 minutes or so, pause and say, okay, I want you to write one paragraph summarizing what we just said about the Christian faith of Robert E. Lee. Just give them a minute or two. You can collect these or not. The idea is by the students writing something down, it helps them to think through what you've just said. It gets them thinking about it, uh, about processing what you just said in the lecture. So, to sum up, the idea is that when you lecture, and lecture is important, but when you lecture, you want to find ways to have the students mentally engaged in your lesson so that you're not just talking 
and them just kind of drowning, uh, ignoring you, or just kind of listening to you droning on and on. Instead, you want them thinking and processing what you're saying. And these are some ideas that will help you with that. Here are the sources for uh, the lesson today. If you want more information, feel free to look these up. I hope this has been helpful, and thank you for watching.